So we are kind of in between um, our Matthew series and Advent. So every year we do Advent as a church. Uh, Advent is kind of waiting upon the birth of Christ. That's the Christmas season. Advent this year starts on Sunday, December 5th. Uh, so for the next couple weeks, these will just be kind of one-off sermons, a lot of the stuff where I feel the Lord is uh, stirring my heart. Um, so I'm excited to get to, to preach a little bit different of things, uh, which will be good. So a few weeks ago, I got home from uh, men's Bible study. Uh, so if you go to men's Bible study, you know it starts at 7 o'clock in the morning on Saturdays, which means you get home around 9 o'clock, uh, if you're me. Uh, so I get in the door, it's 9 o'clock, I walk through my garage, I go to my office, I put my Bible away, hang my keys up. I notice that it's like super dark in my house. Um, I yell to Kristen, who's always upstairs. I, I was like, Kristen, why is it dark in here? Uh, it's nine o'clock. Why, what's up with the lights? And she yells back, well, there's an eclipse. And I was like, there's an eclipse like right now? Why did I not know of this? Uh, so what did we do? Naturally, I tell all four of my kids, okay, grab your sunglasses and let's go out in the backyard. Uh, we realized one thing really quick, even through their little $5 Walmart sunglasses, you should not stare at the sun. It's dangerous. So I was like intending to damage my children's retinas in that moment. We go out in the backyard, we're all looking up at the sun and we can't see anything. So here's the deal. I don't own eclipse glasses for two reasons. I'm not a nerd and I just not a scientist, okay? So we don't have those handy in a drawer. Uh, we had to improvise. Uh, being the improvis improviser that I am, I walked inside, I got my tripod, I hooked my phone on the tripod, and then I went out back and turned the camera app on, pointed it at the sun, and then we zoomed in on the iPhone to see how close to the sun we could get. What did we see? Nothing. I was like, why is it dark? And there's like no eclipse. Very weird. I'm still confused on what happened that day, but here's the point. If you want to see something for everything that it is, you zoom into it. Uh, it's like anything in life except for eclipses, apparently. The closer you get to something, the clearer you see it. All of us can remember trying to get the microscope to work in high school, right? Uh, the closer you get to something, the clearer you see it. Uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about one of the most, probably the most powerful sets of muscles in your entire body. Uh, that's your tongue. Uh, if you zoom into your tongue on a microscopic level, it's actually one of the most disgusting images you've ever seen in your life. That's why I don't have it up there. Some of you could have eaten breakfast. Um, if you zoom in on a microscopic level on your tongue, you'll see different craters that are in your tongue. Uh, all of us in here, God's created us extraordinary. We're all unique, right? All of us have different tongues, um, for instance, we all have different taste buds. Some of you guys think broccoli tastes good, okay? We all are different people with our tongues. But the more you zoom into a tongue, the more you, th more you see these craters. And what's crazy is the craters are an analogy of what we're talking about this morning. Uh, the key point this morning is that the craters on your tongue are actually a window to your heart. So you go so microscopic into your tongue, you should be able to see your heart. And you're going to see these things that I identify as craters uh, in five different ways that the tongue can kind of do things. And none of them are overly positive. Uh, the tongue, we'll see in our text this morning, it can control, it can destroy, it can't be tamed. Uh, the tongue is a fickle thing and ultimately your tongue will reveal who you really are. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn them to the New Testament book of James. Uh, James is near the end of your Bible. It's right after Hebrews. Uh, we're going to be in James chapter 3. Uh, while you do that, I'm going to go ahead and open us in a word of prayer. Uh, Father, I thank you for everything that you're doing at this church. Lord, I thank you that uh, we've gotten to baptize more people today. Uh, Lord, I thank you for your grace. Uh, Lord, as we open up uh, your word that was spoken to us, uh, and we think of the words that come out of our mouths, uh, God, I pray that we can glorify you this morning uh, through the preaching of your word. Uh, God, that you would open up our hearts uh, to exactly what we need. Lord, you'd convict us where we need to be convicted, but show us grace uh, where we need it. Uh, so God, I just give these next few minutes to you uh, and ask that you do what you need in this place. It's in your son's name I pray, amen. 
All right, James chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 2, well, kind of like the middle of verse 2. If you ever wonder what is like 2b, that's just like the second part of verse 2. So, uh, starting in James 2b, uh, James says, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is mature, he is able also to control the whole body. Uh, so, we're talking about the tongue this morning. Uh, But James kind of starts off in verse 2 by saying everything that comes out of your mouth, which is controlled by the tongue. If you're able to control what comes out of your mouth, you can then control your whole entire body. Kind of a crazy concept if you think about it. Uh, But James is a practical guy. James is one of my favorite books of the Bible because I'm a simpleton. He's practical. Uh, So James gives us all kinds of practical ways in which the tongue can possibly damage Uh, So he starts by giving an example of how small things control larger things. He says, now if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we direct their whole bodies and consider ships. Those ships are very large and driven by fierce winds. They are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of who directs it, the pilot, right? Uh, This is our first point. The tongue can control uh, so the first example James gives us is of a horse. Uh, so I've never even touched a horse, I don't think. But here's, here's what a horse does. Uh, it's a picture of a bit in the mouth of a horse. So often you'll see this in race horses. If you watch like the Kentucky Derby, right? A horse will have a bit in its mouth. Uh, and what the purpose of the bit is, is so that the rider can control the horse. So the rider can put tension on the horse's mouth through the bit. And then the horse inherently knows like, I need to change speeds. I need to change directions. So a bit in a horse's mouth weighs about two pounds. An average horse weighs about a thousand pounds, say. Uh, So even though the horse is 500 times bigger than the bit that is in its mouth, it's the bit that controls what the horse does, not vice versa. Uh, Second example is this, it's a ship. Uh, Here's a picture of a propeller, and behind the propeller is a rudder that's outlined in red. Uh, As you can see, the rudder itself, it pales in comparison to the size of the actual ship, but it's that small rudder on the back of a huge ship that tells the ship what it should do. Uh, That's why Paul says here in verse number four, he says, even if a ship is large and that ship is being tossed around by the wind, the rudder guides the ship because the rudder is being guided by the pilot of the ship. Uh, So two small things that James tells us, controlling two large things. Uh, You can see the connection to the tongue. Look at the beginning of verse five. James says, so too the tongue can be a small part of the body. It boasts great things. It's this little muscle in your tongue, in your mouth, but it can control all these different things. It can boast. Like, isn't that true? Like, if you think of the word boast, uh, it means that your mouth can say whatever, whenever, whether it's true or not. To boast is to kind of have haughty language that's meant to kind of stir the pot or just things that, that don't make sense. Uh, So for instance, like this afternoon, Kyler Murray's finally returning from an ACL injury. Praise the Lord. Um, The Cardinals, because he's returning, are going to win eight games in a row. They're going to finish nine and eight. They're going to sneak in the playoffs. They're going to make a run to the Super Bowl, and they're going to win it this year. I call that faith. 99% of you think I'm a lunatic. Why is that? Because I'm just boasting. Like things that will never happen, things that will never make sense. That's pretty much an example of that. Uh, So think about it. The tongue doesn't just control the body. What James is telling us is your tongue controls your whole entire person. Uh, We get to have the such privilege to watch debates right now, this season of politics. You don't believe that the tongue can control a narrative? Just look at politics. Uh, Lies will fly out of the mouths of candidates. Lies will fly out of the mouths of media. Why? Why? just to develop a narrative. So a tongue can control all kinds of things, including stories. So if the tongue can control, it would naturally tell us we should probably be careful what we do with our tongue, right? That leads to James's next point. He said the tongue doesn't just control, it can actually destroy. Uh, Second part of verse five, he says, consider how a small fire sets ablaze a large forest. That's another small thing Uh, that controls a larger thing. But then he compares that to the tongue. He says, and the tongue is that same fire. Uh, The tongue is a world of unrighteousness. 
It's placed among our members, which is like our bodies, right? It's placed among our bodies. It stains your whole entire body. It sets the course of your life on fire. And it itself, the tongue, is set on fire by hell. Well, thanks, James. That is super encouraging. Uh, We live in a part of the country where we see wildfires, right? All up north and in California, um, all throughout the coast, there's a lot of wildfires every wildfire season. Uh, They're extremely damaging. We saw a couple months ago, uh, almost the entire city of Maui almost burned just completely to the ground. You saw houses and businesses just completely decimated. A little spark can set ablaze a huge fire. Uh, Here in Arizona, if you drive up to Flagstaff and you flick a cigarette butt out the window, you have a chain dragging from your truck, just a little spark can fly into the field and next thing you know, hundreds of acres of forestry are just simply destroyed from a little spark. Uh, A lot of you, probably all of you in this room, have sometime in your life heard the term, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Uh, That might be true if you're a robot. Even if you're the most thick-skinned individual in the room, uh, the person you love the most, or the person that you respect the most, if that person comes to you with extremely harsh words towards you, what those words will do in that moment is put a little bit of a dent in your relationship. It's just a little spark up north can set the forest ablaze. You see how a little word out of your mouth can destroy another individual. Uh, I can't tell you how many times in the three years I've been the pastor of this church where I've ministered to people in this church who have had years of relational equity built up with, maybe it's their kids, maybe it's friends, maybe it's your spouse, whatever that years of relational equity that's built, years of love, in an instant, those relationships are damaged, they're changed, they could even be completely destroyed because of words that come from somebody's mouth. Like, look at the words that James uses to describe the tongue. He calls it a world of unrighteousness, like a whole bit of darkness, right? He says it's a stain over the entire body, not just part, the entire body. It sets life on fire, and it itself is set on fire by hell. Uh, For such a small, little insignificant, what seems, thing in our body, uh, those are heavy terms that James is using. Uh, All of us in here, Uh, Use our tongues every single day to communicate. Some of us like to talk. You you use more words than others. The average human being speaks about 15,000 words per day. Uh, This sermon that I'm preaching is 3,700 words. Uh, So I'm doing that twice. I'll speak way more than 15,000 words per day. Of those 15,000 words that you might speak today, how many of those are even thought of before they come out of your mouth? A lot of our talking, a lot of the things that we say come out of our mouths in an almost subconscious type way. And for something that can control our body, something that can destroy others, you see why James takes time in his book to give you a big warning of what that thing might do. So the tongue can control, the tongue can destroy. Uh, More good news, the tongue cannot be tamed. Uh, Look at verses 7 and 8. James is, again, extreme. Every kind of animal, every kind of bird, reptile, fish is tamed and has been tamed by humankind, but no one can tame the tongue. He says it's a restless evil, it's full of a deadly poison. He says every kind of animal, like every kind of animal can be tamed except my next door neighbor's cat, which is always in my backyard. So every animal, mostly, can be tamed. Think about this. Uh, You go to the zoo, a big apex predator at the zoo gets out of control, you can just tranquilize it, right? It's tamed in that moment. You have circuses. Uh, Circuses have things like this going on. You have lions, tigers, rhinos, like whatever, zebras. Just name the crazy animal. Uh, The owner or the one who runs the circus can tame that animal to get it to do things like this. You have like the apex predator of apex predators jumping through hoops in the middle of an arena while people watch. But that's just, that's not the tongue though. No one can tame that. Everybody can tame an animal, everybody can tame everything, but you can't tame the tongue. James calls it a restless evil. I think of that word restless. What does a restless thing do? It kind of describes an animal in the wild, right? Restless. The tongue kind of just roams around like looking to defend itself. It's quick to attack other people. It's quick to guard its territory. It's quick to protect so that it can be king. All of those characteristics are characteristics of not just an untamed animal, but an untamed tongue. But he says it's not just a restless evil, it's also a deadly poison. 
Uh, Think back to Genesis 3. How is Eve deceived in the garden? She's deceived with words. The serpent comes up to her and speaks words into her life. He says things to her like, Eve, did God actually say that? Uh, Eve, you won't die. Eve, just eat the fruit. God doesn't want you to be like him. Just take a bite, Eve. Everything will be okay. How did Satan deceive Eve? Through words. The tongue is something that cannot be tamed. Uh, Final point of bad news, then I'll hopefully get to some good news. Uh, Verses 9 and 10. James says, With the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in God's likeness. Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth, my brothers and sisters. These things should not be this way. Can you just kind of hear the urgency in James's voice? The fourth point this morning is that the tongue is fickle, which means it's just all over the place, right? Uh, One minute the words out of your mouth are great, The next minute, you're completely embarrassed by what you just said. Uh, Think about the song that we sang before I came up here. Christ be magnified, right? What are the lyrics to that song? Uh, Christ be magnified, let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in who? In me. That means that I'm the one, through my words, magnifying Christ. Like, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Just everything that I have, Lord, be magnified in me. We all sit here and we sing those things. Those songs are like prayers, right? They're asking Christ, like, Christ, may you increase and can I decrease? Christ, I'm just pleading with you through song right now. May people one time see you through me. Just be magnified through me. We sing that at 10.45 a.m. And then at noon, you're driving home on the 10 and some fool cuts you off on the parking lot. All of a sudden, Christ ain't getting no magnification in your life, right? Let someone wrong you in a real way. And suddenly these things we sing are just out the window. Think about your deepest, darkest enemy if you have one of those in this room. How do you talk about that person behind their back? Someone who seriously wronged you, maybe someone who seriously wronged your family member, even your children. You see very quickly how you could say one thing in one moment and another thing in another because the tongue is fickle. Uh, So what are we to do with all this? Just leave here with our heads hanging, all discouraged? Uh, James never kind of gives us an answer on how to proceed. Uh, We're all aware that this is a problem, unless you're perfect in this room. uh, All of us in here struggle at some point or another with our tongue. So what's the clear-cut solution? Uh, I'd argue that in verses 11 and 12, he kind of tells us those things. But remember what our key point is. If you zoom in on the craters of your tongue, you'll zoom in deep enough to where you start to see the window of your heart. All those craters that I just talked about, the tongue controlling, the tongue destroying, The tongue not able to be tamed, the tongue's fickleness, those things are craters or dangers in the words that come out of your mouth. Uh, Those things are all telltale signs of what your heart is. Uh, The truth is, the tongue ebbs and flows with your mood, and your mood is regulated by your heart. That's why James gives us the example of a ship in verse 4. You have the ship, you have the rudder in the back of the ship, But what do you ultimately have? You have the pilot at the front of the ship telling the rudder what to do. It's the same thing with the horse. You have the horse, you have the bit in the horse's mouth, but you have the rider of the horse that controls everything. The tongue is the same thing. It's a small part in your body, but it is controlled by your heart. So why does James not give us instructions on how to fix this? Well, remember, James is the brother of Jesus, Uh, So I'm assuming that James both knows and he repeats the teachings of Jesus. Uh, In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus encounters the Pharisees. Uh, He tells the Pharisees, he calls them a brood of vipers. To use words, that's like a horrible thing to call somebody. Brood of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil? Uh, He's saying you can't. Why? Because for the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. So the issue is not your tongue, the issue is your heart. So then the question becomes, where is your heart? This is like a regulator on what your heart is, the words that come from out of your mouth. So here's the deal, if your heart's pure, your tongue will be pure. If your heart's kind of mixed, your speech will be mixed. If your heart's evil, the words that come out of your mouth will then be evil. Uh, That's why James finishes with a couple more examples in verses 11 and 12. He's saying, hey, the tongue is going to reveal who you are. He says, does a spring pour out sweet and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree produce olives, my brothers and sisters? Can a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a saltwater spring yield fresh water. James is saying you either have fresh water or you have salt water. 
Uh, If you drive six hours west to San Diego, jump in the Pacific Ocean with your mouth wide open. Uh, There will be a lot of salty taste in your mouth when you taste that water. Uh, If you do the same thing, you drive about an hour north, Lake Pleasant. Uh, It won't be salty, it just won't taste very great. You might get malaria if you open your mouth in that lake. Uh, You can't expect the Pacific Ocean to turn fresh. You can't expect the Lake Lake Pleasant to turn into a saltwater lake. Why? It's because both of those bodies are what they are. There's no changing those things. And James is saying it's the same with a tree. It's the same with a plant. What those fruits they produce cannot change. And so the point is the status of your heart will determine the words that come out of your mouth. I want us to just think about this this morning. Uh, As Christians, what are we to be known by? Our love, so you can express your love, if we're to be known by our love as God's children and people are able to see Christ through us by our love, how do we express our love? Uh, I think about my wife. How can I show Kristen my love? I can do it in a lot of ways. I can spend time with her. She enjoys me spending time with her. She likes me buying her stuff. Uh, She likes me to hold her hand, like the five love languages stuff. What's her love language? Love her like that. The easiest way for me to tell Kristen I love her, though, is if I just look her in the eyes and say, Kristen, I love you. Words that come out of my mouth. Uh, So I want us all to just do ourselves a favor this morning. Ask ourselves this question. Think about all those words you speak on a regular basis. Do the words that come from your mouth reflect your perceived status as a disciple of Jesus Christ? I say perceived status because a lot of us think we are way deeper disciple than what we really are. Uh, So there may be some of you in this room, you think highly of yourself. You go to church, you serve on a team, you go to a community group, you sit at a Bible study table, you do all these things, but the minute you get outside of those mediums or the minute you get off to the corner of the living room at your community group, the words that are coming out of your mouth are nothing but Christian. They're nothing that alert anybody that you're a disciple. Is that because your heart is just academically transformed, but yet spiritually it's not? Uh, I don't think it's our job as evangelists to go over and just beat people over the head with the Bible and tell them the gospel all the time. But the fact of the matter is, if you have Christ, uh, if you have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit should then radiate in at least some fiber of your being. So the words that come out of your mouth that are a constant thing for you during the day, how do you speak? What words come from your mouth? Uh, Let me give you three different categories of what your tongue might be marked by. Um, So the first thing is this. Your tongue might be marked by criticism. Uh, So if your tongue is marked by criticism, uh, your standard for everything and everybody is up here. And the minute your standard is not met, it's met with a spirit of criticism. So what starts to happen is you see that critical tongue start to slip its way into your marriage. It starts to slip its way into the way you correct your children. It starts to slip its way into your job. And suddenly what happens is your tongue is fully marked by criticism. At some time or another, what you're going to see is you're going to come to a realization is not everyone can make it up to this level that I set for them. And at that point, you're going to have two choices. Uh, Either you're going to have to alienate your own level of thinking and realize your expectations are too high, or others will alienate you because they don't want to hang out with you. So why is that anti-Jesus or anti-gospel behavior? If you have a tongue of criticism, why is that not following the gospel? Uh, If you think of the synopsis of the gospel, we are all born into sin. We are all dead in our trespasses and sins, but Christ makes us alive Uh, Christ reconciles us in our death. He reconciles us in our sin. He reconciles us to God the Father through primarily two things, grace and mercy. Uh, Grace, the definition of grace is getting what we don't deserve. So if I give you grace, I'm giving you something you don't deserve. The definition of mercy is not getting what you do deserve. So you start to see those two things on like same sides of the same coin, right? What do we deserve? Being dead in our trespasses and sins, we deserve wrath, we deserve eternal punishment, we deserve eternal separation from God. But instead, what are we given? We're given grace, we're given mercy, we're given salvation, we're given God loving us, adopting us as a son or daughter, we're given a promise of the day that we die, we get to spend eternity with Him. Uh, If you think of just your human relationships, a lot of relationships wouldn't be in the state that they're currently in if a critical tongue was repented of. Uh, Second, your tongue can be marked by complaining. Uh, This is a little bit different than criticism. 
Uh, You want to see an example of complaining? Just come hang out with me from the months of July and September anytime I walk out of my front door because I hate the weather here. We all know people like this. Uh, You might be one of them. You complain about literally everything. Uh, This is different from criticism of an individual. This is complaining about your circumstances. Uh, Those who complain about their circumstances, the problem with that is those are often the people who are primarily seeking their own comfort and happiness on their own terms. So what does that start to do with you? If you have an overly critical and complaining tongue, uh, what that does is it makes every situation serves you instead of you serving the situation. If that situation doesn't meet your expectations, you complain about it. That thing or that person isn't giving me what I need. So what do you do? You go around in every situation or person that you encounter, you're expecting that thing or that person to fill you when in reality that person can never fill you. Nothing can fully satisfy you on this side of heaven. So what happens is your foundation is all built on your own comfort. The minute things get uncomfortable, then your foundation starts to crumble. So why is this anti-gospel behavior? Well, it's pretty simple. As a follower of Jesus, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, uh, comfort should be the last thing that we expect. Uh, if, you're, if your life is marked by the seeking of pleasure, you are following your heart, which is completely anti what the Bible would tell you. It says, do not follow your heart. It's wicked. So your life is marked by your own desires, which may bring pleasure, comfort, satisfaction. But what you'll start to see is 100 times out of 100, Those things end in brokenness because eternal joy is only found in Christ. So what's the remedy to that? It's to look at everything for what it's really worth. None of the things that are in front of us, none of the things that we seek can truly be our treasure. Only Christ can be our treasure. In moments of hardship, realize that's not Jesus testing you. Uh, Realize that as a Christian, if you encounter trials, if you encounter sufferings, your foundation isn't going anywhere because it's not built on your comfort. Trust that Christ will see you through to completion. Uh, Last thing is this, your tongue can be marked by quickness. Uh, So how does quickness normally manifest itself? Uh, Some of us in here in this room, me included, are very gifted in the areas of both wit and sarcasm. Uh, And I think those things are actually gifts. Um, God's wired me in such a way that I can make people laugh. Uh, But if I just move a little inch to the right or to the left, uh, I can very much use my tongue in such a way that it's like a sword that damages. Uh, For those of you with a quick tongue, do you have the discipline to pull back when your gifting might not be needed? Do you sometimes just talk for the sake of talking and then you're misguiding people in the process? Uh, There's a reason that the Proverbs, much of the book of James have references all over it to the words that come out of our mouths and the importance of it. So odds are most of us in this room this morning uh, can put ourselves into one of these three categories. I preach this message largely to myself. I can throw myself in all three of these categories if I'm not thinking. Uh, So what do we do in this case? For those of us in this room that have a hard time with the words that come from our our mouths, uh, I think the beginning of the book of James is really helpful. Uh, James 1, 19, James says, everyone, all people should be three things. You should be quick to listen you should be slow to speak, and you should be slow to anger. Uh, Just to show you the irony of how things work in a pastor's life, uh, my twins, Knox and Nash, are in first grade. This was their Bible verse this week. Uh, So every day on the way to school, I just hammer them with their Bible verses, because if you're a pastor's kid, you need to get all your Bible verses correct at Christian school. Uh, So what is their Bible verse? James 1.19, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. It's a short week due to Veterans Day. Uh, Their verse was due on Thursday. Uh, So we're driving in my truck to school on Thursday. I say, Knox and Nash, what's your Bible verse? Dead silence. They don't know it. I'm like, everyone should be, one of my twins like, have, behave? No. Uh, Everyone should be quick to listen. They're just not getting it. They're not like slow to speak, slow to anger. What happened in that moment? Naturally, I became very quick to anger. I'm like, guys, why do you not know your Bible verse? Like it's Thursday. You're going to go in there and fail it. Why is that? It's because there's the minute where we start to lose control, the minute where we flip those things, the minute where we're slow to listen, the minute where we're slow to all these things, but we're quick to speak, all of those craters, all of those dangers, those all can be remedied simply by a lot of us just slowing down in the things that we say. 
By simply asking ourselves before words come out of our mouth, before I write anything in this sermon, is what I'm about to say helpful to the person hearing it? And if it's not, sometimes just don't say it. Can the words that come out of my mouth, can those damage that person in any way? And then lastly, do the words that come out of my mouth, do those things glorify God? So maybe you're sitting in here, you've been convicted this morning over places of your tongue that aren't pleasing to God, places where you fall short in that area. Don't worry. Your heart is being exposed for what it truly is. But did you know that in Christ, Christ promises that you're a new creation? He promises you that the old is past, the new has come. So what does that mean? It's when you're convicted over your sin, when you're convicted over a particular issue, all you need to do is repent of that thing, that you simply give that to God, that you simply think through, Lord, how can I be slower to speak? What are the the pitfalls in my life where these craters and these dangers appear? God, would you help me in that area? Would you help me see how I should talk? I could stand up here for hours. This could have been like two sermons, giving all these practical pointers on tips you can do to control your tongue. But at the end of the day, it's an issue of the heart. Do you really love people? Are you really grateful for the life that you've been given? You may be going through all kinds of trials right now, but you're unbelievably blessed. Uh, Do you see ways where you need to change your speech in order to more glorify Christ? My encouragement to us all this morning is give that to him this morning. Uh, Those areas where you struggle in this regard, give those things to Jesus Christ this morning. Uh, Repent of those things this morning. That means turn the other way. Stop doing those things. Uh, Move toward Christ this morning. Would you pray with me? Uh, Father, I thank you for uh, the fact that Scripture tells us that all Scripture is God-breathed, which means like actual words that we get to read of yours. And God, the words in the 66 books of the Bible have the ability to save us, to transform our lives, uh, because you are good and you are perfect, and those words come from you. But God, as human beings, we fall unbelievably short in a lot of different areas. And God, something that we do so often is talk. Uh, We talk to people. We do all kinds of stuff with our tongues. I I just ask, God, that we can honor you in what we do. Uh, Lord, I pray for the people that are gathered in this room that you could just bring to mind areas where we can uh, give to you, God. Maybe it's just impatience in our marriage. It's impatience with our kids. It's just complaining about all kinds of different things that are going on. Uh, Father, I just ask that you would just be able to work in this place, God, that you'd be able to convict us of our sin, that you give us ability to repent of those things. Uh, Father, that you would be able to push us more towards you in the area of what we say. Uh, God, may us as a church be a beacon of light in darkness by the words that we say and the amount of love that we're able to show people. Uh, So God, we give these things to you and ask that you just push us closer to your son this morning. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. So the first person I'm going to ask to come up here is Russell Kennedy. So Russell, I will adjust the microphone. And Russell is not nervous at all, are you, buddy? Um... I told you. Well, they got the lights up, so you can see people, but you're good. Uh, So, Russell, go ahead and read your testimony, and then I'll baptize you. I've always gone to church and have been told about Jesus Christ. My parents have helped me lead me to Christ, and my old pastor and his wife, Doug and Debbie, and Miss Mary, have helped me learn more about Jesus Christ. Now I understand even more and have accepted him as my Savior. I will follow Christ into my future and will keep learning more about him and what he wants for me. Awesome, man. All right, Russell, get in there, big guy. I'm excited for you, dude. I'm excited as your pastor to get to watch you grow. Um, and grow into an awesome young man of God. I'm excited that you're getting baptized today and for accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior. So, Russell, I'm going to ask you, don't go, don't go back yet, dude. Um, cross your arms. There you go. That way I can grab you. Uh, but, Russell, it is my honor as your pastor to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Be buried with Christ in His death. Be raised with Christ in His resurrection. All right. And the second person that we have today is Josh. Uh, so I'm, I made reference that we've got like a guy that does power lifting. This is Josh, so he might stay in the water. I can't make any promises. <laughs> cool. So Michael asked me a couple questions. It says, who were you before Christ? I have a story similar to most, lost, 
no fear, no consequences, troubled youth, rough times, but it seems that just the perception of being young without context. So just following what society deemed popular and trying to figure out what was cool, but it was more of what society thought was cool and not what I believed. The second question was, how did Christ save you? Uh, the moment that came to mind most uh, that I would say saved me would be in 2003 during deployment to Iraq. We had gone 60 plus days without a shower, ate nothing but MREs, wore charcoal lined chemical suits, sleep deprived, and constantly fighting in a country where you didn't know friend from foe. We finally received mail after months, and a package from my grandma and my aunts had sent me a Bible along with letters from kids thanking me for my service. The innocence in a time of evil was like a light in the darkness that night for me. Lastly, now, with the birth of my girls, my sense of worth has risen to a new level, and I look at Jesus more than anyone for my guidance. I reference scenarios in the Bible that closely mimic mine for what to do. Uh, another question, in my own words, profess faith that Christ has saved you from your sin. Jesus is Son of God, and that he was sent here to save us. I am saved because Jesus has forgiven me for my sins. I'm a sinner and will fall short of perfection, but I give everything to him. And the last question was, how do you live, or how, how is your life different now that you are a Christian? When Michael put out the baptism class, I wasn't sure I was worthy in Jesus' eyes, but are you any of us ever? Uh, I'm following the, the Bible and living Christian life with imperfections. When these happen, it makes me feel like I could have done better, and I should change for the next time. I'm still learning. I want to raise my daughters in the church so they know and believe that they are never alone. Amen, man. I'll take, I'll take that from you. You don't have to get it wet. <laughs> All right, Josh. Again, I've been praying for this moment for more than one reason. Uh, <laughs> I got to get a knee up, get some leverage. Here we go. All right, man. I'm sore from golf to show you what I, shape I'm in. So. Um, Josh, man, I'm so proud of you, dude, and it is uh, my absolute honor uh, as your pastor to baptize you in the name of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, be buried with Christ in His death, be raised with Christ in His resurrection. Uh, so I'm honored today we get to baptize my friend, uh, sits at my Bible study table, uh, police officer in the city of Buckeye, so he's the man. Uh, Mark Postma is getting baptized, uh, so Mark, why don't you come on out and uh, read your testimony, sir. I'm not very tall, Mark. That's okay. And I also am not a sound guy, so. We're good. There you go, sir. Thank you, sir. Yep. Appreciate that. Um, so I've been blessed with a good life. I grew up in a Christian home. I was baptized as an infant in the Christian Reformed Church um, up in Linden, Washington. Growing up, attended church, youth group, mission trips, kindergarten through 12th grade, attended a Christian school. I was fortunate to, after high school, go to a Christian college. Um, very blessed life. Through all that, I'd seen and experienced God, but I still had not made the decision to commit my life and follow God and live my life with Jesus in the background. So fast forward to a month ago, I, along with my son, Reese, who was baptized last week, met with Pastor Michael to talk about baptism. Uh, three of us talked through it, and Reese, like I already said, was baptized last week. Um, over this past week, my son and my family asked, Dad, why didn't you get baptized last week? Um, I didn't have an answer. I didn't have a good reason. I kind of played it off. wanted it to be all about Reese last week. So as this past week went on, I um, thought and prayed more about it. Still on the fence whether or not to get it done. Uh, this past Friday night, so a couple days ago, I'm at work. It's kind of a slow night in the city of Buckeye. Um, sent a text to Pastor Michael asking if it was too late to get baptized. Um, so he replied with, quote, we can roll with it. <laughs> I did. <laughs> it was you like did. 10 o'clock at night, man. I'm I like one eye open. <laughs> I was wide awake. I was wide awake, so I was ready to go. Um, <clears throat> so I took that as a sign to be able to go through with it. Um, this moment has been in motion for 30 plus years. Um, I know that I'm a sinner saved by grace. One thing that I've one verse that I found from the New Living, New Living Translation says, even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you've been saved. Amen, man. 
Yeah, speaking in front of people is not my thing either. So, um, yeah, go ahead and hop in. Yeah, sit on this two by four. This stage, y'all could pray that this never caves in while we're doing this. We have no idea what's going on up here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, it'd be YouTube worthy. Uh, Mark, uh, I'm proud of you, man. It's been good to get to know you. I'm honored to be your pastor, and today I'm uh, honored to baptize you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, be buried with Christ in His death, be raised with Him in His resurrection.